I want to cross now to Copenhagen to pick, catch up with Bjorn Longborg, who heads up the Copenhagen Consensus Centre, talk about uh, issues of climate and other global challenges. Thanks so much for joining us, Bjorn. It's always a good... Uh, it's always great to talk to you, but particularly at the moment, you've been writing about where you've been looking at the renewable energy subsidies worldwide and what they total up to. That's right, Chris. It's great to be on the show again. So, uh, look, we're spending $163 billion annually, and that's U.S. dollars, to subsidize green energy, and yet the impact is virtually nil. So we really have to start that conversation of saying, look, what do we want to do? How do we want to be remembered in this world? Do we want to be remembered having wasted trillions of dollars obtaining almost no good? Or do we actually want to focus smart ways of fixing both climate change, but also all the other issues that bother the world and that most people are actually saying more urgent and more important to them? Yeah, this is the critical thing. Uh, we look at cost-benefit analysis in so many areas of government expenditure and private expenditure, and in the climate debate, there's so little focus on this. And this is what you focus on. What is the cost and what is the benefit? Now, you talk about those hundreds of billions of dollars spent globally subsidising renewable energy. Have you been able to quantify the benefit that has delivered to the world in the environmental terms? So, as you probably imagine, this is very, very difficult question. So the answer is probably in the order of somewhere between three and 14 cents of benefits. So for every dollar we spend on these renewable subsidies, we deliver a little bit, but not anywhere close to the dollar that we're actually spending. And that's, of course, a real problem, because we could have done so much better, both on climate but also on all the other issues. Remember, the UN, uh, leading up to its uh, global sustainable development goals, they actually asked about 10 million people around the world, what would you like us to focus on? You know, there are lots of issues. Which ones would you like us to focus on first? They asked 16 questions, and the top outcomes, among the top outcomes was health, education, and nutrition. At the very bottom, at 16 of 16, was climate change. So not surprisingly, when you ask most people around the world, they want very simple, basic things like education, like uh, health care, like uh, their, their kids just simply surviving. And those are very, very cheap things to do. So actually, if you look at how you could spend your money, sure, you could invest green energy money and do much better. That's about investing in green energy R&D. That is about ramping up our, invest uh, our inventiveness so that we will end up doing a lot of good for every dollar rather than a little good. But honestly, there are many, many more things where we could do you know, tens, twenties, even hundreds of dollars of good if we wanted to help the world do more good in the world. I'll come back to some of those issues in a moment, but if we look at just emissions reduction at the moment, obviously global carbon dioxide emissions are still growing quite strongly. So whatever we have done to curb emissions, mainly in developed countries, countries like Australia, obviously China, India and others are still growing rapidly, but whatever we've done to slow the growth has, I suppose, you could, you could argue there might have been some slowing of the increasing damage that we're allegedly doing, but it certainly hasn't made the planet um, any better off environmentally. Uh, it, it has to be. On, on, if carbon dioxide emissions are bad for the planet, it's still getting worse. Yes, and, 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 and actually, I think you'll appreciate this statistic, uh, Chris. If everyone in the world, if everyone in the rich world, that is all the OECD, so that's Australia, Canada, Japan, the US, the EU, every rich country in the world turned off the spigot of CO2 tomorrow. That is, they didn't emit any CO2 for the rest of the century. The difference by the end of the century will be about 0 0.4 degrees temperature increase. So we would avoid a tiny bit of the increase. And that very clearly shows what you were just pointing out, that the real issue here is to get China and India and all the other developing countries to eventually cut their carbon emissions. Now, they're not going to do that right now because they're actually experiencing what we did with fossil fuels, namely that cheap and reliable energy gives you a way out of poverty. So what we have to sh make sure is that they get the technologies that will make it cheaper for them to actually switch over. We don't have those technologies right now, but if we invest it a lot more in research and development to get those next technologies over the coming decades, 
we could actually afford the way a world out instead of just trying to tell everyone, I'm sorry, could you please do with a little less? Could you please stay a little longer in poverty? Well, this is the point where some of the other things you think we could uh, spend money on more efficiently and effectively to improve life on this planet would also improve the environment. For instance, if you, uh, allow p if you help people get to greater prosperity through, uh, through reliable energy and the like, and especially through education, um, they're then able to actually uh, minimise uh, uh, pollution, but importantly, they will access education and, um, and um, contraception and slow down the human population growth in this planet, which, of course, in turn, will slow down the emissions growth. Exactly. And, and, and again, let's remember not to look at everything through a climate lens. Yes, it will also have climate benefits, but most of them just have incredible human benefits. There's about 215 million women who don't have access to contraception right now. If we get them access, that'll cost about $3.6 billion, again, US dollars. But the benefit will not only be that 150,000 moms won't die every year, that 600,000 kids won't die each year because you can space them better and invest better in them. But it also means because they'll have more capital available to them, that you will experience a demographic dividend, as it's called, essentially slightly higher growth rates. We estimate every dollar spent on contraception would do $120 worth of good. And let's not forget the biggest thing of all, more free trade, the thing that Trump and everybody else is trying to prevent in this world. But of course, if we actually made sure we have more free trade, we could lift millions literally 145 million people out of poverty with a successful Doha round. We could make every person in the developing world about $1,000 richer per person per year in 2030. We're missing all these simple things because we're focused so much on this one thing, climate, which unfortunately we can only do really badly right now. So what we should be doing is invest in research and development into green energy, and then remember all the other things, immunization, food, school, as you pointed out, uh, contraception and free trade, that would in total cost less than what we're spending right now on subsidies for renewables. But it would make such an incredibly much better world. And so my simple point is, why is it we're spending all this money on doing almost no good instead of spending this money on tackling global warming better and more effectively and tackling all the other things and actually being remembered for, I don't know, doing a lot of good for the world rather than just a trivial amount of good? Well, the argument that a lot of climate uh, advocates uh, would put is they would say it's uh, increasingly urgent, that it's more urgent to tackle uh, global warming. Now, you are not what people would call a, a climate denier, and neither am I. You, you listen to the science, uh, but you do think, uh, you do argue that these, uh, this catastrophism uh, is overstated. It's not as urgent as, uh, as people would have us think. Well, there's two answers to that question, actually, Chris. One is to recognize that the UN climate panel itself tells us this is not an existential crisis. This is not the end of the world. Even if we do nothing to tackle climate change, they estimate that by the 2070s, the impact will be equivalent to losing, on average, somewhere between 0.2 and 2% of your income. This is when we'll be double or triple as rich as we are right now, and we will see what is equivalent to one recession over the next 50 years. That's a problem that is not the end of the world. But the other thing that I really think is amazing is when you talk to a lot of these people who literally and very genuinely are very, very worried, why the hell is it they would be suggesting, let's do the same thing that's failed for the last 30 years. <laughs> let's try to get everyone to promise to cut more carbon emissions. They're not going to do so as long as it's really expensive. The rich world will cut a little bit to feel good about itself, but will not actually solve this problem before we have the technology to make sure that we can actually switch to greener energy that's also cheaper and more reliable. Now, you've been talking about this rationalist approach uh, to global challenges for many years now. Do you have a better audience now? Are more uh, people and more governments listening? Or are you frustrated? <laughs> Well, I think it depends very much what you think about governments. When you, when you talk about the sort of global elite that we see, you know, they'll gather in New York uh, in in September and talk a lot about climate. No, I I don't have any in there. It's very very fashionable to talk about what is it we should be worrying about about global warming. 
But when you talk with many developing country governments, they're obviously focused on making sure that their kids don't die, that they get an education, that they get good schooling, that they're actually able to get the people out of poverty. So they care a lot more about the simple but incredibly important issues in their world. And so they are listening. And, and I think, uh, to a large extent, we have to recognize that the rich world, the OCD of this world, can manage, as I said before, 0.4 degrees if we entirely turn off all our em uh, emissions of CO2 for the next 100 years. But we're not going to. But even if we did, it would only be a trivial part of the climate conversation that we could actually fix. What we need to recognize is this is about China, India, all the others, and they honestly want to get a good life for themselves first. What we have to make sure is that they get the technology to both have that good life, but also have greener energy that emits lesser, preferably zero CO2 in the long run. Now, Bjorn, uh, only going back a few years ago, you were looking to set up a, a centre, an offshoot of your Copenhagen uh, Consensus Centre here in Australia. It created all sorts of backlash from our universities and the idea was dropped. You might, you might have heard that uh, a centre, a proposed centre for Western civilization in our universities had a similar difficulties here in this country, but it's now been established. Two universities, University of Wollongong, and the Queensland University have decided to back it, uh, which is a great thing. Uh, do you have any appetite to try again, uh, given, uh, pardon the pun, uh, do, if you see the climate is changing here in Australia, uh, would you be interested in re-examining a proposal for a Copenhagen Consensus Centre branch here in Australia? Well, look, what we were going to do with the uh, Copenhagen Consensus in Australia, the Australia Consensus Centre, was all about helping the developing world to do more good. So it was about the development money spent in Australia. It was misportrayed as a climate centre. Uh, so we can do this from anywhere. I would love to work with the Australians again on focusing on how do we get smart development money uh, spent around the world. And I think it's an important issue. But honestly, it's something that we can do everywhere. We're right now doing it together with Ghana and Africa. We just did it last year. Uh, with India uh, for two states in India and with the uh, central government's think tank. So I'm very excited about all the things we're doing. I would love to do this together with Australia. But really, this is more about getting the global conversation right. And fortunately, we can have that global conversation, even if I'm, I'm, I'm here in, in Malmö in Sweden. Indeed. Thanks so much for joining us, Bjorn. Appreciate it. Thank you.